Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Ken Engelsfeld. I am uh, uh, working in EASA at the in the EASA uh, drone section, and I am going to moderate this uh, workshop, for which I would like to uh, warmly welcome you. We will focus on um, the maturity uh, of the technical solutions and the availability of industry standards uh, for the use space in order to support the implementation of the four uh, mandatory use space services and the two uh, optional ones. Um, wait, I will check if this works now. Yes. So don't hesitate to raise your questions through the Slido. You have the, the hashtag there number where you can post your comments and uh, we will, uh, with my colleagues, uh, we will uh, uh, have a look at them and then uh, of course uh, we can uh, I don't think we can display them on the screen but uh, I will um, I will mention them verbally uh, as they come during uh, this session um, before I do that I just would like to uh, thank first of all the, the, the panelists there we have a uh, uh, five distinguished uh, panelists who are going to contribute to this workshop. Uh, they come from a different environment and I will uh, maybe just before uh, setting the scene uh, for this workshop, uh, I would like just to briefly introduce uh, them one by one. Uh, starting with uh, the ladies, Larissa. <laughs> Larissa works for the Strategy and Innovation Unit um, of the Federal Office of Civil Aviation, FOCA, that focuses on Switzerland's uh, forefront position of uh, disruptive innovation trends in aviation, such as UAS and UTM. She coordinates uh, and represents FOCA's interest in international regulatory and policy making efforts and is currently working on the establishment of the first use space, airspace and use space services in Switzerland. So you, your presence here is uh, very welcome, Larissa, uh, and very relevant for this uh, panel. Um, Maria, who is uh, sitting there in the very uh, uh, light green jacket, <laughs> uh, is my colleague, and uh, she is the uh, EASA Drones Program Manager uh, at EASA. I think most of you know her in this room. Uh, she has been also um, very active uh, these uh, last days um, and also preparing the whole conference, <laughs> uh, of course, but also participating this morning uh, as a moderator and she will still be uh, active uh, this afternoon. Um, Maria, in, in addition to be a technical expert on UTM, use space and drones regulation in general, uh, she is actually leading the drones policy and strategy uh, for EASA and reporting directly to uh, our executive director, Patrick Key. Um, I come to you, uh, Ralph. Thank you very much also for being here. Uh, Ralph is a co-founder of Dronic, uh, which is a German company that is positioning itself uh, as being cert a certified USSP. He leads technology, IT, and product development. Um, Ralph has over 15 years of professional experience uh, in information and communication uh, technology as he was vice president for technology innovation at Deutsche Telekom. So thank you very much Ralph for being uh, with us today as well. Um, Kuhn, which is sitting next right to me here, is the co-founder of Unifly, which is a now, I think, well-known uh, company providing UTM technology uh, to enable the safe and efficient integration of drones in Europe and also beyond uh, the EU. Kuhn has been very active since the start of the regulatory development of U-Space and has participated in the drafting of the AMCs and guidance material in particular uh, for the work package on the network ID. And finally, Andrew. Um, is also, I think, well known in the U.S. community. He's an expert in UTM uh, concepts, working for the EU Control Innovation Hub. Uh, Andrew was the technical uh, coordinator of the Chorus project, which produced the CONOPS for uh, U-Space, and he is now the technical coordinator for the uh, second step of Chorus, which is the Chorus XUAM, um, the extension, basically, for the urban air uh, mobility. 
Um, Andrew has closely also followed the development of the use space regulations and he was the team leader uh, of the work package proposing the AMCs and gases material on the uh, flight authorization service that is now uh, in, the P in the NPA and uh, we will of course have the opportunity to uh, discuss uh, in length also uh, this very important uh, service. So welcome to all of you. I would like uh, now just maybe to set the scene um, very briefly because uh, I think what is more important is that we go uh, really directly into the uh, panel discussion and, uh, and also uh, to the question and answer uh, session. So what I would like to do here now is basically just to uh, not educate you but uh, remind you because you all know what are the four mandatory use space services. We have the network ID, we have the geo awareness, we have traffic information, and then, as I mentioned, the US flight authorization service. These are the four mandatory use space services that are in regulation 664. And we have also um, optional service. I'm not sure if optional is the <laughs> right term to, to describe them. I would say probably more supporting service, but these are, uh, they are actually optional because uh, in opposition to the four other ones, they are uh, not uh, mandatory in accordance with uh, the regulatory uh, package. <coughs> so in the two optionals, we have the conformance monitoring service and the weather information service. Um, just at the level of the regulation, you know that if you have read it very carefully as I did, <laughs> uh, you will see Basically, the objectives, uh, a bit of the content, the obligations of the USSP, what they need to provide as services. Uh, it, it's still quite high level, and this is why we have produced this material uh, on AMC and gases material in order to uh, give a bit more uh, meat uh, on, the, mm, on, on the services. So if you look at the regulation, uh, really this is quite, as I said, high level and uh, you will find more uh, in the AMC and gas and material, and this is why we have also received quite a lot of comments uh, on the NPA only on uh, chapter five um, related to the, no, it's chapter four, I think, <laughs> related to the use space services. In the, in the NPA 2021-14, uh, uh, which, um, which contains the AMCs and guidance material, I have highlighted there basically what we have worked on, what we are proposing now in the NPA. It contains uh, some performance requirements uh, in terms of latency. We give sometimes some figures uh, in order to be or to try to um, meet um, uh, the, the, the required performance uh, for uh, not all but some uh, of, the, of the services that have been lot of work that, uh, that were conducted by the different work packages in the drafting of the NPA. And uh, sometimes it is true it was not easy to, um, to, to attain the objective that uh, we, ha we, we had set, but of course uh, it, is, um, yeah, it is a first, I would say, package. And uh, there will be, of course, uh, a, a next iteration of the uh, of this of the AMC and gather material uh, while you know we have more experience while uh, the use based services also uh, are becoming m more mature also depending on uh, what are uh, coming out from uh, all the the, the demonstrations uh, if any of them uh, are ready uh, soon to be validated so we will take all this into account in order to uh, bring more uh, more of these yeah, requirements or performance uh, provisions uh, for the use based services. So we refer also to some industry standards, uh, s some specifications. We have, have highlighted here data quality because I think this is very, uh, this is very important. Um, although we are not going that far in it, but at least it's a first step. And then uh, also uh, in terms of, uh, um, for the GRNS, where we are also referring to the, the, to the UK uh, standard for the, for the format. So these are elements that uh, you have seen probably in the uh, provisions that we have proposed uh, in the NPA. Um, 
Yes, uh, that was just to mention and to reflect on some of the standards that uh, are referred in the uh, in the NPA. We will, I think, have the uh, opportunity to discuss them uh, more at length, uh, probably during the course of this uh, panel. So you see, we have some for the network ID and for the JNS, and this is what I said: we don't have um, reference to industry standards for all of the of the services. But uh, as I said, this is the first um, uh, step. Um, for the uh, optional service, uh, I have just um, circled here a few proposed performance uh, requirements, both for the conformance monitoring service and for the uh, weather information service. Um, this is based on expert judgment. Uh, there were a lot of discussions within uh, those, uh, those groups and, uh, of course, um, we will look uh, in the uh, comments that we received on the, on the NPA if uh, these are uh, figures or proposals that uh, could be uh, used uh, for now. So um, that was a very brief <laughs> uh, theme setting. Um, as I said, you probably uh, know uh, the, um, the, the, the regulation better than I do uh, by now. So it was really just to kick off this panel. And I would like now uh, to uh, give the floor to Ralph for the opening of, uh, of, the, of, of the panelist session. Thank you, Ralph. I give you the, the remote. It's kind, thank you. The feeling I have this mic in, in my <laughs> mouth. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, Ralf Schepp, I'm CEO of Dronic, as uh, Ken mentioned. Um, I'm a telco guy, so please don't wonder that I have also some telco slides with, it, with me, but it's uh, rather short, to be honest. Um, we wanted to talk about uh, use space and their applications for operation in urban environment. Um, we recently did a big exercise in Germany in the so-called uh, U-Space sandbox in Hamburg, where we trialed out how U-Space could work in such a really dense environment within the control zone of an airport, within a harbor, so everything you need to make it rather complicated. Um, and we felt that this was quite a challenging exercise because many things have not been sorted out so far, so there are still very much open points, many handish points, talking about the activation, for instance, of the, of the use space flights. Um, we set up a control center with two people sitting in front of three screens, which is probably not the way in a digital world you would do it at the end, uh, managing thousands of drones. Um, so what we have is, and you, we, I personally very much hope we stick to that, uh, we have a date which is the 22nd uh, of Jan next year, um, where use space regulation comes into place. We have, as uh, Ken mentioned, four mandatory services, uh, which we are able to fulfill at the moment. Um, and the good thing from a mobile network perspective is that uh, mobile network at least plays for three of them a key role. And I think even when we are talking about urban environments, we shouldn't care also too much um, about uh, network capabilities because they are typically quite well equipped in urban areas. What we also have as an enabler is a new set of drone functions or drone itself. So uh, this fancy silver device in the middle, which is actually pretty big on the screen, um, is a really tiny device, matchbox size big, uh, which, uh, which connects the drone to the use space. So you simply hook it onto the drone or glue it onto the drone. Um, it has an own battery, it has an own GNSS, and it sends the position data uh, into the UTM system in order to make you visible as an airspace participant um, to all other airspace uh, to other all airspace participants. It has uh, LTE. It also sends out FLAM as an additional security feature, and uh, also receives ADSB. So it's on one hand a receiver, on the other hand a transceiver. Um, that's a, I always call that bridge technology because I always hope that uh, drone manufacturers will build these things 
into their drones from the scratch um, in future onwards. There are some underway already. Um, on the right side below, you see the Parrot AI, which comes with the LTE connectivity. On the upper right side, we have uh, so-called MK1 from our partner Sky Drones, who flies already with 5G. Um, there are solutions in between, like uh, the orange one, which is a LTE-based flight computer from Ontario on Skynote. Um, and uh, yeah, we have a good piece of software by you guys of Unifly um, in order to manage these things with that. Um, so the puzzle pieces technically wise are underway. They mature each day. And uh, I'm really looking forward to see much more and more devices connected in the near future. What customer wants from U-Space is actually something different. Customers want not, not even to fly. So drone customers basically want data, which they gather from the drone, or they want to transport something. It's not about getting things flying. They want data or transport. Um, they want that BB lost. So we strongly believe that a U-Space market or uh, a drone market, which is, which is uh, hindered only to work in visual line of sight, will not work. Yeah? I, d I, I personally also don't really believe that this is a way forward. Either you fly BV loss and you fly one pilot, many drones, then it makes sense in the terms of flying robotics, um, or it will be rather complicated for many years ahead. And, um, and this should show the fast scribble picture beyond. Um, you, have to, you have to take attention to very much regulatory things. So it's not only about use-based regulatory setup, you need to take care of the UAS certification, which many of our customers struggle with at the moment. Um, you have to take care of the payload you put in, mission planning and so on. So there's a huge bunch of work to get that probably easy step done. Customers always expect it to be easy. They want data, they want transport, but at the end they need to fulfill a huge bunch of uh, services and certification levels in order to get that. Um, and this must be, at the end, easier. I know I'm talking about, uh, I'm talking in front of many aviation people. Um, I would rather love to see use-based market being more flying IoT, so an internet device which flies at low level, um, then call it, call it really an aircraft. What we currently need, and this is something which, which drives me most um, because we are uh, heading for this USSP certification process, we need an adequate certification process which doesn't hinder the market uh, to go onwards, which doesn't cause too much cost in order to um, be attractive at the end for the market, because I guess what we all have in common is we want a competitive use space market, and in order to be competitive, it must be a very attractive one. And we want a responsible role of the USSPs. It's very important to me, so either we, we certify USSP quite heavily, and when we certified him, we trust him that he can do his job, or we leave it to the, to the competent authorities which are in place already now, um, which then for the customers makes it even more complicated. We need a single source of truth, so may it be a single CISP or based on standards, however, this must be extremely cost effective, cannot be the case that at the end um, we will all have to pay for a certain amount of data upfront, uh, which will overburden the market with too high costs. Because drone flying is all about efficiency at the end from a customer perspective. And therefore I'm also asking for a, a stimulus or a catalyst in that market. We have talked a lot now about getting the regulation done, um, getting the framework done, and in the meanwhile I think we have lost many players. <laughs> We have lost them, yeah? Some of them are going bankruptcy in the meanwhile. Um, others uh, are still waiting. Is this really now the case? So it would be 
cool from everyone in the room, from EASA, from the European Commission, and also from the, from the national entities, uh, that we get a push in that market, which says, now we are ready, now we can go and uh, run new spaces, and uh, with that make the life in urban air mobility a little bit a better one. So that's my part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralf, for uh, opening from a company's uh, point of view uh, this session. Uh, everything is well noted. We know also from an EASA perspective, because uh, we have been also visiting you. Uh, we know your products. We know what you are aiming at. And uh, of course, all the uh, elements that you have raised uh, here in this presentation, uh, of course, are very valuable uh, for uh, this discussion today. And I will certainly have the opportunity to come back to, uh, to those. Um, the second pre presentation, we only have two, don't worry, uh, <laughs> is uh, from uh, Larissa. Uh, as I said, uh, you are representing the, uh, the, the competent authority in Switzerland, and we will certainly also probably raise the topic of the role of the competent authority in that regard. But uh, before that, I would like to uh, give you the floor for your presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So I would like to take the opportunity of the next few minutes to shed some light on the, the la latest developments that we had um, in the course of the implementation of the first use space airspace in Switzerland. So we are in FOCA clearly heading to have the first use space airspace uh, established until uh, March 2023. So it's an ambitious goal. Um, but yeah, so um, we're optimistic to manage that. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, and one um, of the very latest um, development or the latest news that I would like to share here in this um, setting is um, the call for expression of interest that we have launched um, a month ago, um, really with the goal to explore the USSP market. So, um, as we all know, the regulation introduces a new entity, which is the USSP, and with the USSP, a new market, the USSP market. And um, what we have said from a regulatory perspective, yes, we need um, a better understanding on this market. We need to know who is wants or intends to operate in this market, also to be prepared for the certification procedure that will um, follow. And for this reason, um, we set up a quite a simple, a simple tool on our um, website um, and really to um, motivate um, all entities that have an intent to provide use-based services um, in Switzerland to fill out a form and let us know. And um, until today, so today is the deadline um, of submission and we received about um, 40 replies from different entities around the world. And yeah, this is also for us a quite um, unexpected high number. So it showed us also that our proactive um, initiative is also much appreciated by the industry. And yeah, we try to also to get them the opportunity to get in contact with us, um, to have bilateral calls now after that and find out um, how um, the certification process is going and where are the things that yeah we need to tweak and um, uh, discuss again. So, and what we've also learned from the results from um, this call is um, something quite interesting with the view of having a USSP market or um, our use space market. Um, so the regulation did a great job, um, EASA, the EU Commission, in setting up the innovative and also innovative friendly policies um, for a single competitive USSP market. So um, we learned a lot from the traditional aviation, from the natural monopoly uh, setting in ATM, and yeah, transformed the learning to, to adequate policies to enable really this uh, competitive um, competitive market and as we see so we received 40, 40 answers of entities that have an interest in participating in this market in a competitive way so it's really also a signal that the, uh, the interest is there um, in, the, in this industry as well and of course this 
also calls uh, for um, interoperability, <coughs> so having the, the standards in place that really um, enable the, the USSPs to um, exchange that data, the relevant data, um, with the relevant um, entities or USSPs. Um, and the last point I would like to highlight in this context, um, which is also very important from our perspective, so showed us, coming again back to this high number of replies, that we need um, some sort of uh, automated system to, to the certification process. So um, a manual certification process or a testing process, it's not really lit you can't scale up and for this reason we're quite engaged within the <coughs> private public <coughs> partnerships with youth space implementation that we are in together with the uh, Swiss ANSP Sky Guide and about 30 um, private companies um, to develop this uh, automated testing framework um, to really enable um, USSP to test their services and also enable and continuous oversight um, from a regulatory point of view and um, yeah, improve the service constantly and improve the compliance with the existing regulation in a constant manner. Um, this is just a quick graphic. I don't want to deep dive in that. That um, highlights again the, the certification process. And I think from our perspective, the most relevant or the tricky thing starts um, <coughs> in, the, in the field um, below on the right side when you have the onboarding process of um, USSP. So um, once a USSP is certified by the competent authority, it is, um, it is enabled to, to provide services throughout Europe. Um, and he, um, the, the company needs to report the start of the operation in the specific country he wants to provide um, the services and then the onboarding procedure starts. So this is how we frame um, this on onboarding procedure, so you need to have some sort of agreements in place between the different USSP um, that uh, enable them to have this the interoperable um, exchange of, um, of data that they um, really also to make sure that they comply to the standard and that they know which data they need to share um, in which manner. Um, and for this reason, we set up also in context with SUSI different agreements to really make sure that we have this coordination um, among the different USSPs um, and the other actors that are active in the U space, air space uh, in place. And next to that, part um, of this onboarding <coughs> procedure will then also be the automated testing and oversight framework that I explained before. And with that, I'm coming to my last slide. I'm quickly running through that. Um, maybe just um, as a quick update um, from the service provision point of view. So we've already um, finished the automated testing um, with the flight authorization service recently, two weeks ago. Uh, we finished uh, the automated testing with the network remote ID service uh, already in August last year. Um, and this is already available in Switzerland um, on a voluntary basis. So um, since August, basically uh, operators can use this service um, and law enforcement uh, agencies as well. Um, yes, and we already had a lot of learnings in these terms. So um, what we experienced in these past few months, so we were motivated or yeah, all agree that we want to implement this service um, already on a voluntary basis. So from a regulatory po point of view, you have basically two options. You can um, wait until, until the regulation is available and then Im or, or uh, enforce and then implement the service or you can um, be proactive and um, implement the service even before, learn together with the users, together with the industry, um, iterate, um, ideally, uh, maybe uh, tweak the regulation or change the regulation, or at least you are ready once the regulation comes into force. And this is what we have done. Um, we've already had the possibility to test the automated testing framework, to test the master agreements we set up. Um, and also what we have seen is that 
basically what the people say they or think they need is not always the same what they really need. So the, <laughs> the service is not really used so far, um, neither from law enforcement agencies or uh, authorities, um, nor from the users, even though we received a lot of um, feedback before from uh, different entities to really to implement this service to in, in order to um, raise transparency, in order to um, minimize the, um, the um, anonymity. Um, but we have seen now that, um, yeah, the, the since it is on a voluntary basis and the incentive is not really there to use the service, it's not being used by, yeah, by none of the actors. But this is really, uh, this insight is of high value <coughs> actually because when you do demonstrations, for example, you don't you don't see such such psychological um, things that you yeah you just realize that once you have really implemented the service and yeah that this gap be between what people say they want but what they really want um, yeah is sometimes bigger as you think. So and um, with that, I thought I've run through all the points of the slides. Maybe just as a um, quick view in the future, so we are currently um, coming to the automated testing of geo-awareness and then the automated testing of the uh, conformance monitoring service will come uh, last exact. So that's it from my side for the moment and perfect, thank you. Thank you very much Larissa, I think you have uh, highlighted a few uh, very good points there. You mentioned uh, the understanding of the market. You, you mentioned interoperability, how important the management of the data is also crucial. Um, automation also, and how all these elements uh, will contribute uh, uh, later on uh, on the, on the uh, maturity of uh, the use space uh, services. So thank you very much for, uh, for this opening. I come uh, to you, uh, Kun. Uh, you are, as I said, the co-founder uh, of uh, Unifly, but I would say with your hat of uh, regulatory affairs manager, uh, as I said, you were also uh, deeply involved in the uh, development of the drafting of the AMC and guidance material. Maybe one question to you, Kun. Um, from your point of view, um, technical solutions exist. I know you have said this to me already uh, several times. Um, yes. Uh, they are available, but although you see quite some um, maturity in them, you would also like to highlight um, the, the, the most important challenges uh, that you see uh, in them. I know that you are uh, eager because when you uh, contact us, it's also with a uh, a, a lot of words and a lot of uh, uh, good expression and, uh, and and passion that you do that you do this. So um, maybe you could uh, address the audience and uh, maybe elaborate on these challenges uh, that you have shared with us uh, at EASA uh, previously, and uh, maybe you would like to share them now with the with the audience on the on the maturity of the service and the and the industry standards that uh, we have uh, uh, proposed now in the NPA. Thank you. Slide. Yeah, voilà. thank you. Thanks, Ken, indeed. Um, yeah, involved since the very beginning at Unifly, and then we are implementing uh, as we speak. Eh, for, for many of us, use space is still, I would say, a theoretical exercise. But as we speak, we are implementing two use space systems for some clients as we speak now, which want to be ready even before January 2023. So although the thing is ongoing, we, we are implementing it now. We are also implementing UTM systems in other parts of the world. So. Um, and there are many questions, yeah, on, on how it will all function. It has been mentioned, and, and also the f next uh, the, the past few days on, on okay the viability, the business case around that. And so I will not jump into that one, but um, I think generally, and I was indeed active in, in many of the working groups and for for, the for drafting the AMCs and the GMs. Um, generally, what we could state the whole concept of UTM use space, as we call it in Europe, eh, I think. I think the requirements I should have put the services, I think they are mature, yeah? Flight authorization service is quite clear what it means, and we have a flight authorization service in our system. Although, okay, in within new space, we have a certain European implementation and regulation which has expressed what it should do. 
Um, remote ID, that's quite clear. Traffic information, I think we have a common understanding what it could mean, although uh, we have some certain European exp explanation and we have the legal framework which, which outlines this. Um, so, general scope, yes, we know what, what it all means, but, but okay, the, the challenge, what we noticed is that when somebody, a client comes to us and says, oh, make me a use space system compliance with the regulation, then the devil really jumps up. And it's in the details with the implementation. And uh, I was part of several working groups, and, and I even, uh, yeah, I'm guilty of some of uh, some of those things <laughs> standing there. So, <laughs> but uh, what we what we face basically, uh, we we had an, and Ken mentioned it. We 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 have mentioned a reference to a few standards, E two six nine, the ASTM one, which are all basically. Okay, I think that, that but that's a bit my personal reflection. We, we, uh, UTM is per definition a digital system. We have gone the way through Europe and we have chosen also to go for a competitive market with multiple players within one airspace. So we go immediately for the most complex implementation you can imagine. So that comes with, uh, with some consequences and a price. Eh? We have to exchange data and that's what, what we now face. Eh? For example, we, 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 we have to agree on standards on how to exchange data. And we made reference to ED269. I think that's we took something which existed, but, but, but people knowing that standard, that's not meant for use space. It was about uh, geocaging for, for drones and exchanging geo information. So we took one particular chapter from that standard uh, on the data formats. But the, date, the standard that existed was invented and discussed long before use space existed. So one of the issues, for example, we are facing, okay, we have to exchange to the operators, a use space area, but ED269 does not allow me to define it fully, honestly. You have some, it's it's really standard with some attributes and there is no attribute use space. There is an attribute, it's a conditional area, it's an area which is authorization required, it's a prohibited area or it's a fourth one which I forgot. Which one is use space? Is that an area which we define as for which an authorization is required or is it a conditional area, an area on which conditions apply? So these are the choices which we have to make when implementing. So when I talk to my engineers, they say, yeah, Kuhn, it's zero or one. So black or white, say, no, no, it's a bit gray still. No, no, I said, I have to implement it, say it what it was. So we try to find, as now as we speak, some, some, some way around it, and we will reach out to EASA to, 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 to tell them what we have uh, found out. Basically, when implementing our things, again, we are implementing as we speak. We had to make choices based on existing standards, which are really, as I put it, not really suited for, for the goal. I think there are some ways around. Also, the ASTM standard, as we take it literally from, uh, eh, from for the remote ID. In Europe, we have the operator ID. It's a mandatory field. Well, it does not exist in the standard as it currently exists. Uh, I think probably they are working on an update, but it does not exist. So my engineers come to me where I have to put operator ID. I said, yeah, I don't know. And then the question is, okay, I cannot implement it. So that's that's what we are really facing today. So and uh, that's why uh, we will uh, reach out to EASA for the next update of the MCs. We hope to get this more clear. Another thing is also the lack of uh, lack. Yeah, the we are we want of at least the goal in Europe is that we have a harmonized implementation as much as possible, but there also we have some devils yeah, popping up. Um, in the regulation, the flight authorization service, I was part of that group with, with Andrew, ending of a flight, as you might have noticed, is nowhere mentioned, yeah? Nowhere. We have difficulties of defining an AMC on that one because uh, honestly, we are implementing different endings of a flight. So if an operator wants to come to country A, it might be that the procedure of ending a flight with a USSP might be that one going to another country with another USSP, that might be another way. And we have a clear understanding about activation of a flight and authorization, but ending a flight, yeah, we have the freedom for 27 implementations, I would say even more. So the same is true for, uh, uh, it's all very essential and which at the beginning, we, you don't notice. Um, also, uh, okay, we should exchange 4D flight volumes. That's the strategic deconfliction. And then we read in the regulation, yeah, we have, it's only once mentioned deviation thresholds. Yeah, what does it mean? Uh, and, and, yeah, <laughs> shit, <laughs> what does it mean? And then, uh, yeah, 
we look in the MC, what have you written on that one? And said, yeah, I'm probably, <laughs> sorry guys, it's not so clear. And then something pops up as protection buffers. And then within that volume, 95% of the flight should happen. But then they come back, but is it with the protection buffers or the deviation threshold? So basically it boils down to the question, if we exchange data with another USSP, what do we have to exchange? Is it what the pilot has planned? And what does the pilot plan? Is it its volume with deviation thresholds? Is it the volume with deviation thresholds and protection buffers and so on? So this is all quite lean still in the, in, in the regulation. It's very difficult also to frame it on the other hand. Eh? So it's a, it's a bit of a difficult situation, but these are the challenges we, we currently face. And then you have other things like, okay, maybe on the technical issue like e-conspicuity. I think there's a whole discussion which might pop on that one, but, but, but that's, that's one I think technical wise, but, but um, that's not really an implementation. Well, the implementation, it says, the, re the regulation says, uh, USSPs are responsible for capturing this data. And then it's uh, really, um, I challenge you, uh, well, how many antennas do you have to put in Brussels to capture in a decent and safe way the ASD signals, of a ADSB signals, for example, or the FLARM signals. So there are a few implementations which are written there, which, which I think, yeah, poses us a, a few problems, and, uh, and I think we should try to tackle as much as possible in the next uh, uh, update of the EMC and GMs. That's that's basically the main the main message what I want to give. So we are implementing new space already now, and we are facing some some imperfections, I would say, which we have to uh, try to yeah um, work on in the next months and uh, probably years to come. Because it will only, I think we will try to solve as much with AMCs and GMs, but we might need also an update of the regulation itself to solve some fundamental issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kun. Um, you see, I was not lying eh, when I told you that uh, he was very passionate about what I was, still was, I was still about. <laughs> yeah, I was still quite <laughs> 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 uh, uh, Yes, I'm, I'm happy that uh, you, you have done this in a, in a time frame. <laughs> I agree uh, with Maria. You I could uh, elaborate more, I know, I know. <laughs> No, but thank you very much for highlighting this. I guess that uh, also some of you in the audience here uh, also s share some of his uh, concern. We will try, of course, as much as possible to fix them uh, through the uh, review of the uh, of the NPA. Of course, we are also bound by what what, what is available outside there and uh, to what um, uh, industry standard we can rely on. If uh, I mean, sometimes they are going beyond. Uh, exactly what we would like to target. Sometimes they are a bit uh, short of technical details, so this is why we are uh, we are still, I mean, in a, in a learning process also in EASA in order to see how best we can uh, come up with uh, the, the the best approach uh, and visible envisageable for uh, for supporting the the regulation in that regard. Thank you very much, Kun. For this. Okay. Um, Andrew. I would like to, I have already his slide, your <laughs> uh, display your slide. I would like to come to you uh, with your uh, wide experience um, regarding uh, or your recognized expertise in the cross uh, XUIM for UIM. You closely followed also, as I said, the development of the, of the AMC and guidance material where you were leading uh, the work package on the flight authorization uh, service, which is now uh, in, the, in the NPA. Um, I, I would like to touch uh, uh, with you upon uh, more specifically the industry standards. Uh, Kun has already gone quite deeply <laughs> in the technical uh, subject, but um, the, the specifically on the guidance material, Article 10 is on flight authorization, so this is, <laughs> this is why you would probably hear a lot of Article 10. Um, there is one guidance material, uh, Andrew, on, the, on Article 10, which refers to the ASTM standards, uh, F3348-21, uh, the one for the US uh, uh, supplier uh, interoperability, um, which should describe how different uh, USSP discover conflict between their flight authorization requests. Maybe I can ask you, with the help of this slide, to elaborate a bit more on this? Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Ken. So Leading up to this, um, this presentation, uh, there's been a problem with the standard, which is if you go to the ASTM website, you can't find it, it's not there. And we've been greatly vexed by this because it was approved in December. So we mentioned it in the AMCGM as being a, an acceptable way, or it's, it's actually guidance, as, as how the 
use-based service providers should connect to each other and should discover between themselves when there's a conflict. And throughout the period that w the guidance material was being um, written, we were expecting that this, this standard would appear on the website, and it didn't. And then the consultation period began, and, and it still wasn't there. I was getting a bit anxious. I was writing to ASTM, where is it? And finally, it appeared, I think, this week. Uh, it's finally available. But just before that, because it, it's not been there, we've had a lot of people asking questions about how do the use-based service providers connect to each other to discover problems. And there are many times suggested that this should somehow involve the CISP. And it, it's my fear that that decision becomes something that people begin to do, and that's not the intention of, of what's written in the regulation, and it's not the intention of what's written uh, in, in the AMCGM. The mechanism that we would like to use is the mechanism described in the standard, which was a standard written, although it's ASTM, A used to stand for American, it's now ASTM International. <laughs> the team included Larissa's colleague Benoit, it included one of Kuhn's colleagues, uh, I was involved, many other European people were involved in writing this standard. And this standard is based around this idea of a discovery and synchronization service, which could be something hosted at the CISP if necessary, but it's not necessarily there. It just needs to be somewhere on the, uh, in the network of the USSPs. And it's the discovery and synchronization service is a, um, effectively a database which can be replicated and so we can have multiple instances if needed. And this diagram which was produced by Ben Pelletier from Wing uh, and is part of the work that was done in the ASTM working group explains briefly, I won't go in, into it in detail, about how the use-based service providers make known their interest in different parts of the sky at different times and then others can see that and can discover when there's a conflict. So this is just to say that this problem, which is one of the ones that Kuhn is, is hinting at, has actually been well thought of. It's just it wasn't published in time. This was the catch that we have. So this is a kind of practical difficulty that we're facing here. And, and there is some hope that there is a solution here. But I must say, one of the interesting conversations I've had this week was with Antoine Martin from uh, DSNA who commented that we're only going to know the details of all this stuff when we've actually made our first implementations. Yeah. And I think by the time we do that, we'll be ready to write the AMCGM, but it'll be just a bit too late. So I, I imagine that we'll have another revision to make, and uh, I quite imagine Ken or, or later Stefan will be calling me and saying, can I come and take part in the Article 10 equivalent? So I look forward to another few years of this work. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for, the, uh, for, for explaining uh, all this. Um, yes, certainly we will have more uh, opportunities uh, to discuss uh, all this uh, aspect when uh, we are going to uh, have a more profound review and uh, when we will know more about uh, these, um, these standards. Um, maybe before going to the panel discussions with some specific questions that I have prepared for you. Uh, maybe, Maria, I would like to come to you. You, ha you have heard, of course, uh, what the four panelists have uh, just um, described as their uh, opinion and their view uh, for, this, uh, for the opening of, um, of this panel. Um, you being the drones program manager at, uh, at EASA, you have been involved, of course, in the UTM and use space since the very beginning, somewhere in 2015 or 16 or even, or even before. Now, five or six years later, um, how do you see things progressing at, uh, at European uh, level based on the information that EASA has, uh, has available and based uh, on the information provided uh, also now by the other uh, speakers, how do you see the, the maturity, and because this is the core uh, uh, subject of this uh, panel, how do you see the maturity of the use space uh, services and the, and the standards to support implementation uh, of, uh, of the four services across uh, the EU by January 23 uh, or 26, two, two, 2023? Um, and what 
in your mind you think EASA can do to support uh, this? Thank you very mm. much, Ken, and uh, thank you very much for the uh, earlier speaker's insight. So I can give you two views here. As you said, we started all this journey with the Cesarion undertaking back in 2000, um, I think it was 16, when the commissioner said uh, in Europe, UTM will be US-based. It's uh, you because it's your space and because a man. And uh, we started with developing uh, with, uh, I think in the group, it was almost the same people. I mean, <laughs> I have the impression, <laughs> Kuhn, it was Raz, <laughs> and many other colleagues around. And if you ask me from 2017, when we were having all these working groups, and I was uh, chairing the, the, I have the pleasure and the honor to share the working group established by the Sergeant undertaking on the standards and regulations. Um, we, we are really maturing, I think, because when we were having, at that point in time, okay, your space is your space, so there was, uh, at that point in time, there was an initial concept by NASA. There was, um, we have the blueprint with, uh, with, the, with the four uh, phases, with the set of services, uh, we have the, at the beginning included uh, in there the e-registration uh, of the operator, then out. Um, so we went really through a long journey. So I mean, if you start from that point of view, we have an initial regulation. We have never said is the end uh, regulation. We said we need the regulation. Why? And that was, I think, uh, it was a, uh, a difficult decision to make uh, because uh, we didn't have mature standards, we didn't have mature concept, and we didn't have mature service. But if we would have not done the regulation, we would have today 27 plus any more whatever US-based implementations in Europe, and that would have been completely um, difficult to change. If we take today, for instance, single European sky, who tries to harmonize the previous existing ATM systems implemented in each member state with the aerospace classification and, and so on and so forth. So we would have been in the same situation um, in two years' time where we wanted to come up with the regulation and then trying to harmonize all the implementations made by the member states. So, I mean, is, 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 it was a risky decision that we took. So we said, okay, well, let's just start with something. Although we all know that we don't have a mature concept, um, we don't have a mature definition of services and, and, and even less uh, uh, standards. The standards is when you can standardize and harmonize. Um, how we manage safety? We put a lot of safeguards, and still um, uh, there were some safeguards that were, um, were not anymore in the regulation, in the final set of the regulation, but they are still, we believe they are still in the mind, and they are still within the, uh, with the whole safety assessment. When we, we made that safety assessment to develop the regulation, and just talking like uh, the early implementation as the beginning could be limited unless you have a good visibility of your traffic. 500 feet, so uh, in order to um, deconflict as much as possible uh, man traffic and unmanned traffic, not always, but that will be already a first, um, let's say, safety layers, restricted aerospace, but then, okay, we evolved that idea. It was uh, also a, another sort of safety layer. Um, the electronic conspicuity, um, it's there as well, it's not perfect, and we are still at the AMC. We, we have a very basic uh, AMC with a set of parameters, but still the transmission layer is, 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 is undecided. So uh, we believe that uh, it's not perfect, it's the first, but we need to modify. So I can only fully agree with Kuhn. I mean, we, we are now, and with what you have said, uh, uh, Andrew, we need to start. We need to uh, start doing um, a testing. 
So I, I'm very pleased to, to, to hear what, what you are doing in, 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 in Switzerland. So you are testing um, the services. At the moment, you are testing them um, individually. But at one point in time, we will need to test them working together. So one transferring information to the other, because that's how it should be. Um, and uh, I think what you are doing also um, in Hamburg, I mean, you are trying to implement something, implement a concept and trying to see, okay, how, what do we get? And then with all this feedback from Cesar, with all this feedback from the, uh, from FOCA, then we will, we will need, of course, to modify and improve the regulation and improve the ANCs and guidance material. Just have a look into how many amendments Annex 2 of OSA has, uh, uh, of uh, ICAO has had. So you will see that, I mean, at the end, I mean, we need to, to, um, to constantly improve the, the regulation and the, and the services, because even today, uh, can you not only read it, you wrote it, the regulation. <laughs> so um, we, uh, and, I, and I was working with you, and today I read some things and I say, how is it that, um, wait a second, what did we have in mind with that uh, sentence? <laughs> And um, even though we try to catch up the concept uh, also um, in the explanatory no and then in the agencies and guidance materials, today I come back and I, I say, was that necessary? Do we need this or do we need something? Or in other places, why is it that we don't have anything more? And um, yeah, so I think it's, uh, it's, it's gonna be, um, we're gonna all mature together. And today we have here a fair representation of Europe, but uh, I mean, Europe is uh, 27 now, plus EASA, four member states, so, uh, which will adopt the regulation. So we will then see when we start to implement it. I don't believe by 26th of January, 2023, we have all USPs are up and running everywhere where it's needed and all USPs can go and plug and play. Um, uh, from Switzerland to Spain or to, to France. I, I don't believe that is going to be the case, but I think it's important to keep that date. Ralph, we're not going to change. It's going to be that. Because it's only when we start implementing things and we will start seeing things, we can start really uh, assessing and, and, and trying to monitor all together. Um, what can we do to support this journey um, with Ken and uh, his uh, successor now, because Ken unfortunately uh, was a bit tired of your space. No, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> but he's going to be so going to the commission uh, for some years. Uh, and we will have a new colleague, Stefan, is also there sitting. And um, so we will uh, start uh, and supporting implementation action plan and there will be a lot of actions. Um, again, I was very pleased to see Larissa has already anticipated one of the actions and, uh, and uh, we will create a specific, um, like always in EASA, we have a problem, we create a task force. So we will create a task force uh, in order to try to uh, get um, a change of already existing approaches like uh, FOCA but try to involve other member states because what we want to have is an harmonized certification approach for USSPs because this is the way we'll be, uh, start also by forcing the harmonization across Europe. And, uh, and I think you got it, I mean, uh, very well in your uh, slides is this uh, automated uh, um, oversight process, but we need to think, you know, what are the parameters that we need to have automated in order to ensure safety? And in order to ensure uh, also that we are not uh, in the USSPs visiting Ralph every, um, every six months uh, to make a visit, because I guess he has more important things uh, to do than answer our questions. So we only visit Ralph uh, when we need to visit Ralph um, or, or, or Kuhn. Um, and uh, th this is, I think, the thing. But we need to bring all member states along. So, and uh, uh, it's, it's as, as usual in Europe. So there are some member states that they are very um, 
very uh, deep uh, in the development and the discussions and others uh, because of other priorities in the country. They are maybe uh, no, not so deep, but we need to bring everybody with us. So, and this is the next step, is bringing everybody along because 2023 is there. And therefore, we need to publish the AMCs and guidance materials. It's gonna be not, not going to be perfect, may not contain all the details, and we need to start working uh, with that. So we count on your support, colleagues. Uh, so you already helped us for five years. So a little bit more, I mean, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> not too much to ask. We just started in your space, so we have a long journey to today. So thank yes. you. Again. Thank you, Maria, and that was, I was going to conclude on this, uh, oh, well, <laughs> that, okay, that it is still <laughs> a long journey uh, until we uh, fully, uh, I would say, implement. But thank you very much for your, for your insight and uh, all the very uh, interesting um, elements that you have uh, brought. I think there, are, there were quite uh, some uh, good information for the audience today uh, to understand really the context and uh, where we are uh, evolving for the, for the moment. Um, I, I would like to go to the panel discussion uh, now. We have 26 minutes uh, left, and um, maybe I would like to uh, come back to you, uh, Ralph, um, because your, your presentation showed that uh, you are really working uh, really hard huh, to uh, start your business. And in that sense, I would like to ask you, um, of course, as the main topic of interest uh, for, the, for the members of uh, or for the audience uh, today is the maturity of the use based services. Um, how far are you at, uh, at Dronic with uh, really the technical implementation of, uh, of use-based services? Yeah, um, it's basically like Kuhn said, I mean, there are some details to be clarified from, uh, from a technical perspective. This is all not rocket science, um, not at all. The thing is, um, and this is why we need this kind of standards, and I highly appreciate that, Maria, you're completely right. So also for me, it's clear it's a journey. But we are so we're talking a lot about technical solutions. We are talking a lot about uh, regulatory perspective. At the end, someone has to pay for all that fun, fancy thing. And this is where I'm a little bit worried about looking at the market who's waiting for quite a while on that, uh, on that maturity. Um, there are extremely heterogeneous players on the market with very different business models which we have to reflect and uh, at the end also need to be able to serve. Um, and I probably a, a quite simple practical perspective, Andrew, on the, uh, on the USS interoperability which you showed up. This is technically wise, regulatory wise, might be a totally easy one. Market-wise, this is really challenging. Oh yes. Yeah, because I tell you, it's there are there are some guys from the mobile industry here. What would you expect? Does it make sense to be the first one rolling out 5G or 6G networks? Never. It costs a hell of a money, and the first people starting that are always the ones who pay the most at the end. Yeah. Um, what do I mean by that? If you if these front runners, like we also want to be a front runner, um, we invest in a lot into the market. If we if we insist and 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 bring out infrastructure in order to gather data about lower airspace, yeah, ADSB antennas, flam antennas, whatsoever, then it must be assured that we can monetize them, yeah, and not freely share them with everyone else. I mean, data is the gold of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. um, from a from a security perspective, it's totally clear to me that does, that does, that this must be the case at the end. From a practical perspective, I would rather say, well, it's my data, and if if this is not my data, then I'm waiting until someone has gathered all the data and then wait wait for him to share it with me. Mm. Yeah. Um, so there there will be things which we will definitely learn. Uh, in, in, the, in the sort of that process. I also like the uh, very much the FOCA approach. We need this kind of automization of certification and we need uh, pretty fast to be that harmonized across Europe. This is crucial, yeah. really crucial. Uh, if, we, 
if we get the, the national competent authorities mandated now and they start from the scratch and probably this will be organizations which typically uh, certify ANSPs or something like that, they will act totally differently. Yeah, mm -hmm. And uh, this is also one of my, my fears looking forward. Um, we need, we really need a, a good coverage of that uh, certification layer being harmonized across Europe. Otherwise, it's not a fair game. Um, and at, at the end, uh, yes, we've talked a lot. And from the beginning, my heart is really with the customer at the moment because I want to see drones flying. And this will not happen if we install a use-based system. And this will not automatically happen if we have USSPs. But this comes with making it easy to the customer to access this market. For me, this is a huge challenge. As I want to be a USSP, I have to translate what we all have in this fancy AMCs and guidance <laughs> materials into an easy service. <laughs> Click and go, ideally. Yeah? Um, and it doesn't help me to know that I, I have to activate a use base, but not with people sitting in front of screens waiting for getting a final check with the tower and then say, yeah, you can go. That's, that will not work. Um, that will not work in a, in a market which we hopefully all expect uh, with thousands and millions of drones in the air. Yeah. Um, this is my perspective. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ralph. I think you uh, m made clear what were really for you uh, the, 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 the day to day practical perspective and what is missing there, and also what was your uh, major fear in the in uh, with regard to the certification process of uh, of drone thank you for for reflecting on this um i would like to come to uh, to you larissa uh, you have uh, shown us and you have explained us um from uh, from an authority's perspective what you were uh, i would say accomplishing um with regard to certification um now, now that there, there, there has been this survey, um, in, in your views, how many interested parties uh, or entities does uh, FOCA uh, expect to certify in the future? What is your opinion? So, um, yeah, good question. <laughs> so we deliberately um, kept this survey quite open. We just said, yeah, report us if you have an intent to um, provide use-based services. Um, and this is why we probably also received um, so many different answers. Now the next task is um, to assess these answers, to translate basically this quantitative data we have in more qualitative data, um, getting bilateral calls with the different, the different entities that uh, participated to this survey or to this call, and then find out um, what are the administrative and uh, technical um, capabilities of these uh, entities that have submitted um, this, um, this call. And what was interesting to see there um, is that just a small part of the replies we received are companies that have their principal place of business in Switzerland. So there are many um, companies worldwide that have an interest in operate in Switzerland and in many other countries um, within EU as well. And this is uh, why we need, um, coming back what you have said, um, Maria, um, that we need a certain level or harmonization throughout Europe, especially also in the certification process, absolutely. And what created um, us some sleepless nights the last few weeks is as well um, what comes after the, cert the certification. So you are certified as a USSP and then you're basically um, able to operate um, throughout Europe. But uh, member states, they need to onboard you. And I shared our views, how we see the onboarding process from a Swiss uh, perspective. You need the necessary agreements or sign the necessary agreements as a USSP and you need to run through the automated testing procedure. But uh, it can be that other member states design this onboarding procedure differently and this uh, puts a burden on the USSP and also some um, high trans uh, transactional costs actually to, to get this information and to um, 
yeah, amend to these different procedures. And I think we need also here um, a harmonized approach um, for this onboarding process throughout Europe, really to, to um, lower these barriers and the burden for, for USSPs to be active across Europe and make use um, of the single market. Thank you, Larissa. Um, coming to the second point, I mean, uh, we know that uh, in Switzerland you have already implemented the network ID uh, at the quite early stage. Um, what have you learned from this early implementation for this uh, for this service? Yeah, it's basically what I've already said in my presentation yeah. before. <laughs> so, um, and it underlines again what um, that what Andrew said before. So you need to um, implement a service. You need to get to the implementation in order to, to learn and then uh, amend the regulation or tweak the regulation and get learning out of this. Yes. And um, yes, with the network um, identification service, I think it's uh, the best example for that. So we also learned a lot of um, psychological um, um, futures, how the society thinks about it. And I think or I hope that we can um, also transfer these learnings when it comes to the implementation um, of, of use space, air spaces. So how society um, accept this that on the in terms of public acceptance. So and that, yeah, what society says or reports that um, she thinks about um, the issue is not always what she really thinks. So really to close this gap um, and to get insights in this, I guess we really need to come to the implementation as, as fast as possible and get the learnings um, out of it. I think as long as everything remains in theory or in on the level of demonstrations, you can have some learnings also in technical uh, point of view, but um, yeah, it's of course much, much richer when you, when you are f in the final implementation stage. Thank you, Lisa. And I would like to come to a point uh, which was also discussed yesterday in, a, in another panel, which is of quite interest of, uh, of everyone. And this is the coordination with local authorities. You know, the regulation in Article 18F uh, requires that the designated competent authority shall ensure coordination mechanism with local authorities. Uh, in, 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 the Swiss, um, in the Swiss case, what do you see as a, an advantage of this uh, coordination mechanism and where do you see if, there's, if there are any, <coughs> I would say, uh, extra layer of complexity in ensuring this for an authority uh, point of view? Mm. Um, I think one advantage is um, coming back to this public acceptance issue. So um, we realized, so we our aim is to have this coordination or the implementation of use space air spaces in uh, Switzerland, really to have a, to design that as a co-creation -crea um, procedure together with um, uh, local authorities. So we've already started to get in contact with them, talk to them, explain them the concept, um, and see um, yeah, what they think about it. And I think one of the big advantages is they are, they are, um, uh, they are very close to the, to the society. So they often have quite innovative, innovative tools also to interact with them, to collect their opinions, um, and also to, to democratize, basically, um, the, the city or whatsoever, the area they are, they are um, acting in. And we also intend to make use of these tools and of their know-how uh, to interact with society. Um, and I think this is, this is a, a great advantage. And of course, it's, uh, it takes time um, also to, to talk with them, to have discussions with them, um, to transfer the, 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 the know-how, the concept. But I think uh, in the longer term, it definitely, definitely pays off. Thank you, Larissa, for for all this uh, very good explanation. Um, maybe I would like now to, because I'm looking at the time <laughs> mainly, we have 13 minutes left. Uh, I would, uh, I wanted to, no, this, it was not this one, it was not this one either, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and no, before going to uh, Maria, but she has already, uh, I, I would say, explained and uh, uh, given her opinion, I would just, uh, I was thinking now because we received a question uh, on the connectivity, uh, Andrew, uh, for you. <laughs> um, 
And uh, you know that uh, Annex 4 of the regulation men mentioned this um, expected connectivity uh, methods and uh, identification technology. There's no guidance uh, about this. And um, maybe you could uh, uh, give your point of view on what is this all about. And uh, there is a question that was uh, just also uh, in relation to this also uh, put on the on the on the slide about the connectivity with drone, which is essential to fly safe safety. Um, Will as a force telecom providers to guarantee a good connection signal signal in the sky, <laughs> and that would probably also be s of interest for uh, um, uh, for Ralph uh, on, the, on this uh, question. Andrew, I'll answer the first part. So yes. the, the <coughs> this gap in the guidance material, which uh, I was a bit embarrassed about, but the guidance material was adapting or reacting to what was in the regulation, and in the regulation in Annex Four, you'll find this. Uh, couple of things that we, we, we didn't know what to say. I mean, the Annex 4 was written inspired by the ICAO flight plan, and in the ICAO flight plan quite early on, I can't remember if it's field four or five or six, you have uh, equipment, and there you can put single letters, and they indicate what the aircraft is capable of transmitting or receiving or, or behavior it has. And um, clearly, whoever wrote Annex 4 was inspired by this, and they wrote down what useful things they would like. And one of them was the expected connectivity method. I think uh, there's another one for which we have no guidance as well. Um, a few. <laughs> yeah. And basically, we were looking around, is there a standard? Uh, could, is there something we can refer to? Can we, can we find somewhere a, um, a list of what people are using and, and put it in and refer to see that standard, and, and then you'll be compliant? And there isn't a standard, because we're in the early days here. Standards are usually written by people who've got something and they would like to have it used. And we're in the opposite situation here. We, we have needs, but we're hoping somebody will provide standards for them. And this does happen. I mean, there's a, a parallel in the electronics industry. Uh, JEDEC laid out a roadmap of years of things that would be developed and eventually they appeared. But we had, we still working on that. And I, I think there's hope. I mean, I, I noticed he's not in the room today, but Philip Kennel is here, who's the leader of F-38 ASTM. He's interested to have a discussion about what should they be working on? What standards are needed? Can he go back and set up some teams to develop something? And I think we need that in this industry, partly driven by the, the regulation, and partly it's going to come from our experience. Uh, Larissa talked a lot about this automatic testing. Automatic testing is usually based on your previous experience. When we find new problems, we'll put them in the automatic testing, and they will drive us to need new fixes, and these new fixes will need to be standardized. So I think there's going to be an ongoing process that will keep us busy for quite some time. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Ralph, can you maybe elaborate a little bit on this uh, connectivity question that we have? I'm sorry, uh, we are not able to display the, the, the slide and the question. So uh, about this connectivity and how easy it will be in, uh, to guarantee uh, safety in the air. And when we say in the air, it's between ground and uh, uh, around uh, 120 meters. Uh, w w what is your view? You, uh, of course, as a specialist in the also in the telecom area. Yeah. Um, I think there is no legal way to enforce telcos to serve that area at a certain uh, SLA. Um, and even if it would not bring any more economic benefit from my perspective. So uh, besides aviation regulation, there is also a telco regulation. Um, it's, it's still under consideration what you can do with mobile frequencies in the air from the ground to the air and vice versa. It's quite challenging for mobile networks to have flying UEs. That's not the same kind of uh, user interface like you have them on the ground. Um, so, but, but economically, and then we're coming back to the market, for telco this is a non-existing market so far. Yeah, so even if 1,000 drones would fly at the same time, <laughs> they would simply not care, and so the, the mobile network does. Um, which is actually good, because I think on that basis, we can start because it's the only basis we, we have commonly. Yeah. Yeah? And there might be measures to say, um, 
let's, let's make sure that we exactly know uh, where mobile connectivity is available and where not, and maybe adapting geozones around that um, might be much more easier than enforcing someone to do something which is uh, economically nonsense. Um, on the other hand, uh, for sure, telcos have also an interest to in enrich and enlarge their, their kind of business. Um, but at the moment, I would say, there is not even a chance for them to differentiate or to see at the end, uh, because if they would see, they would probably be able to price that differently. Yeah, But this is simply not possible. You cannot distinguish between a normal UI on the ground and a drone up in the air. And it causes a lot more uh, network um, network uh, density and, 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 and capacity issues. Uh, if you if you have a broadband upload from the air to the ground, yeah, um, this is this is let's say one side of the medal. The other side of the medal is uh, everything you would need for make something e-conspicuous uh, would refer at the end to to mobile radio spectrum, and mobile radio spectrum is an extremely scarce resource. It's not widely available. So even if you would apply now as aviation for 20 megahertz in whatsoever mid bands, you would not get them probably before in 40 years or so. Yeah. Um, if you would do so, you would see how much that would cost. Yeah. I've did spectrum auctions for Deutsche Telekom. Um, no one was below one one billion at the end. Yeah. Euros. Um, and this is something the market needs to deliver back. So the, the very good thing is we have, uh, we have in Europe widely available mobile networks, which we can use for that purpose. There is no reason why we shouldn't do so. Um, we, need to we need to know more about the propagation of the mobile networks in the airspace and how that works and how that interacts. From my personal perspective, it might also make a difference if it's sunny weather or cloudy weather, yeah? Because you have different kind of reflections of the, the, the radio on the ground. Um, but I'm pretty sure that we are able to, uh, to, 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 to model a 3D landscape where we can exactly see yeah, the probability that you get a, a, a proper connectivity stream in that area is 99% uh, plus. Yeah? And the rest is best effort, and it will always stay best effort in the mobile industry. Thank you, Ralf. Um, can we, can yes, we? Maria, go on. Yes, please, no, I please. want just a bit to react on uh, what uh, Ralf has said, uh, and uh, and this is it's going to be a challenge because we are uh, we are discussing about okay, perhaps not at the very beginning, but if we really want to implement, as you said, thousands of drones. Um, beyond this line of sight operations with other aerospace uses, so above 100 feet, then we are talking about safety or life services. Mm -hmm. And when we are talking about safety or life services, um, so uh, it's uh, and based on the mobile technology in which we don't have um, uh, a commitment of performance because, as you said, they could not care less. They are just maybe, I don't know, 0 0.000, 000 one percent of their users, yep. um, so we cannot force them to provide uh, any performance. Everything will be really down to um, it will be down to the assessment of that aerospace, considering the network performance, and down to the USSPs and the operators um, to uh, to decide whether the performance of the network which may be available or not, is, uh, is uh, good for them to conduct the flight that day mm -hmm. or that moment, because as you say, may change, uh, as it's not designed for the purpose of aviation, may change of the day to night. Um, we try to be very performance-based in the regulation, but I think we need to start looking into the implementation and what we really um, can get and how much we can rely. Mm -hmm. and whether we need um, uh, connectivity systems uh, developments specifically for the purpose or not, because as you said, the price will 
increase if we need a dedicated system just yep. for that, then at the end what matters is, uh, is, the, is the operator, the services, but unfortunately is sharing the aerospace with others. So is that, is that, is that a difficult balance that we are need to, I would say a difficult dance that we need to dance together? Uh, because uh, it's, it's going to be uh, difficult to try to find, um, uh, I would say, what is actually the network, how much can we rely on a mobile telephony network? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, so, so I would say um, it's something EAS is not used to because we are not, so far we never dealt with the mobile telephony companies. And that, uh, and, and we have our, uh, in aviation, we have our frequencies for us, so they are reserved. Now we need to share with uh, my key and the yeah. for the garage and everything. And so they are pretty small. Yes, yeah, so, um, so now we start to, 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 to enter into uh, something so far we, we are quite comfortable. Um, so yeah. So we need to, I, I will say from the mobile, I mean, this connectivity, the use of mobile telephony, how much we can rely, is still something we need to work together. Yeah. I, don't, I don't want to be too pessimistic, Maria. No, please, uh, you, you were very no, no, optimistic uh, right now. We were about implementing new space tomorrow. The point is, you know, <laughs> ev every mobile phone you carry with you is also somehow safe of life, right? So uh, yes. there every... There are no stations at the streets anymore when you can call someone. Yeah, every emergency call is done by a mobile there. phone. Um, so it's not the case that it's a non-service. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is also very important to me, this is not a static thing. Yes. So the mobile network is extremely dynamic. Mm. If if a cell in a certain uh, network area is overcrowded, only at there are different there are different levels, but um, only crowded only at a peak cell in a busy hour, in a peak second, at 50% of the capacity, a technician will go out and screw another sector uh, on it. Yeah, So that's a quite dynamic thing. So I'm, I'm pretty convinced if uh, there are two facts which will lead to the fact that telcos will move. The one is the traffic increases in the air because this will lead to effects they see in the mobile networks and then they will have to react anyhow. Um, because th what they cannot afford is being the mobile networks on the ground crashed mm. via such exercises. So um, I'm totally convinced that we will find a way out there, but it will be, it will be a tete-a-tete. -tete. It will be a, a dynamic one where we put something in and, and near each other in, uh, in a certain manner. Thank you, thank you, Ralph. Very interesting, and Maria as well. Thank you. Very interesting debate <laughs> on the mobile uh, telecommunication uh, uh, opportunities. I, I'm looking at the time. Um, I would like. Uh, I'm happy that I have Maria because I don't need to do the conclusions. <laughs> um, but just uh, despite of the time, I just wanted to because we still have some questions on Slido. But I would like to check if someone in this room uh, has any question for one of the panelists uh, that uh, he or she would like to raise uh, now. No? Okay, I don't, see, I don't see any. What we will do then, because the time is running, we will, uh, of course, uh, keep those uh, comments or those questions that we have. Uh, we will also assess them in the uh, overall uh, uh, assessment that we do with the comments on the NPA, and they will be, uh, of course, uh, uh, tackled there and uh, covered by uh, our responses in, uh, generally uh, on the NPA. Um, Maria, maybe I can leave the closing remarks uh, to you. Uh, I know you have already said quite a lot uh, on the maturity and, uh, the, and the harmonized uh, approach for implementation. What we, as the ASA, we can do to support uh, the, um, the industry. You have also mentioned the task force that we uh, intend to uh, put in place for the, uh, for the implementation um, of, the, uh, of the regulation. Um, I'll probably let you the floor to conclude with maybe this uh, last slide here that uh, we have just published on, the, on our website. Thank you, Marie. Thank you very much, Ken. No, I don't need to conclude. You have made the conclusion. I just would like to take the opportunity to um, 
of this meeting, and thank you again, I still a little bit of the time of your panel, uh, to inform you that uh, uh, we have decided to do um, a, a leaflet, is now published uh, in our website, uh, with very simple things that we extract on the regulation to try to have uh, represented the U.S. space uh, um, uh, regulation. So it's not, um, I would say, it's not the U.S. space concept that Cesar is putting forward with uh, Corus and Corus X UIM uh, for UIM implementation. It's just to try to put in a picture the main features of the regulation today. So it is more to support uh, um, uh, those who want to implement our, uh, authorities, local authorities who have not been involved, UIS operators to try to help them what they can expect, what they, uh, what they cannot expect, what they can do. So we try to have uh, actually two A4s uh, uh, with uh, some uh, basic information. So of course it's not a repeat of the regulation, it's just try to explain a little bit in bullet points, uh, uh, the main uh, concept. So read it, uh, please give us uh, feedback. Uh, we believe that this is really more um, interesting for UIS operators in the, uh, in the open category that they may fly in use space, aerospace, or a specific category, um, and they may not be so aware and they are not really keen to read the regulations. So here we, here we got it, we explain. At the end, is, I mean, it, the regulation is what matters, uh, but we try to, to make it a bit easier. So here we go. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank and thank you to all of you for attending this uh, panel. I hope that you will also stay with us uh, for the next uh, sessions that are taking place this afternoon. But in the meantime, I just want to uh, wish you uh, a happy meal. <laughs> See you. Thank, thank you. you very much.